Dear Lord, we thank you for being with us through another week. The days go by so fast and yet, we, and yet so much can happen. Lord, I thank you for each person here this morning and ask you to hear their prayers and bless them and their families. Lord, we pray for our, our friends and loved ones who are facing illness or surgery right now. Please, God, watch over their care and hold them close and give them what they need in order to heal or to be strong or patient or, or hopeful. We, we pray for their recovery. We, we, we pray for those who lost, has lost loved ones. Console their hearts and give them a sense of your closeness. Please bless these families with your mercy. Soothe their hearts with passion, compassion and help them through these difficult days. We pray for the unspoken prayers today. You know the, their requests and needs. May each one have a patient and faith in knowing that you are taking care of them. We also like to pray for all the families in uh, Puerto Rico and that everybody in Puerto Rico will um, get what they need, the food, the water, all the facilities, electrical, hopefully. Um, we pray that that will be coming to all those people very soon. We pray for this church and for all the ministries that happen here and all the ways the people who serve it, you in this place. We continue to pray for the search committee as they continue to search for the pastor who you have for our church. And Lord, we thank you for the answers to prayers that we've had this week and for your presence in our lives, for the encouragement in your word and the comfort and fellowship of our church family. Thank you for watching over us and for listening to our prayers. In the name of all, in the name who taught us to pray, saying, our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand and, and um, we perform our first hymn, Lord, I lift your name on high, on page, on page 107.
Turn your handle to 147. 147.
inside of your bulletin for responsive reading. Today is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us be glad this day for life, for breath, and for freedom of worship. Blessed are you who come in the name of the Lord. We come to offer our gifts of praise and gratitude to the name of creation. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to be in your house once again, to worship you, to honor you, and to start off our week with you. God, we ask that you would challenge our hearts and lives today. God, that we would know that we've met with Almighty God when we came here this morning. And we ask that you be with those that can't be here. God, whether it be traveling away, closing up vacation homes, summer homes, or just not feeling well or housebound. We ask that you minister to each and every one. Wherever they are, God, we ask that you speak into their life, speak into their situation, minister to them, encourage them, and build them up. Lord, we love you. We worship you. And we just ask that you'd be here with us this morning and that you'd find our praise and worship honorable. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Again, return to the inside of your bolts and we'll read the confession in unison. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to give back to you with all that you've given to us. We ask that you take the needs of the, uh, take our gifts this morning, let them meet the needs of this church, and go above and beyond. In Jesus' name, amen. But the Israelites were unfaithful in regard to the devoted things. Achan, son of Carmi, son of Zimri, the son of Zerah, the tribe of Judah, took some of them. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel. Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Beth Avon, to the east of Bethel, and told them, go up and spy out the region. So the men went up and spied on Ai. When they returned to Joshua, they said, not all the army will have to go up against Ai. Send two or 3,000 men to take it, and do not weary the whole army, for only a few people live there. So about 3,000 went up, but they were routed by the men of Ai, who killed about 36 of them. They chased the Israelites from the city gate as far as the stone quarries and struck them down on the slopes. At this, the hearts of the people melted in fear and became like water. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down on the ground before the ark of the Lord, remaining there till evening. The elders of Israel did the same and sprinkled dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, sovereign God, why do you bring this people across why did you bring this people across the Jordan to deliver us into the hands of the Amorites who destroy us? If only we had been content to stay on the other side of the Jordan. Pardon your servant, Lord. What can I say now that Israel has been routed by its enemies? The Canaanites and the other people of the country will hear about this, and they will surround us and wipe out our name from the earth. What then will you do for our own great name, your own great name? The Lord said to Joshua, Stand up. What are you doing down on your face? Israelite, Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things that they had stolen. They have stolen. They have lied. They have put them in their own possessions. This is why the Israelites cannot stand against the enemies. They turn their backs and run because they have been made liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. Go, consecrate the people. Tell them, consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. There are devoted things among you, Israel. You can stand against your enemies. You cannot stand against your enemies until you remove them. <clears throat> then the Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. Take the whole army with you and go up and attack Ai. For I have delivered into your hands the king of Ai, his people, his city, and his land. You shall do it to Ai and its king as you did to Jericho and its king, except that you may carry off their plunder and livestock for yourselves. Set an ambush behind the city. Here ends the reading. This morning the title of the sermon is Consequences of direct disobedience. I had children's chat today as well as other things, so here's what we're gonna do. We have this book, you know what it is, just don't say anything, I couldn't find a fitness book this morning. It's called Going the Distance, and I have a pillow. This is what I want everyone to do, you all look tired, so those that are capable, please stand up. If you wanna get fit, right, you can't sit on the couch, correct? Everybody stretch. Uh, nice. All right, I want five jumping jacks. Oh. <laughs> I can only do those in the water. You guys are horrible at listening. <laughs> very, very disobedient. We're not taking down AI with this group. So here's my point. You can be seated. If you follow a fitness book, right? This is not exactly a fitness book, but it'll tell you how to get in shape. Correct? Yep. Now, if you take the fitness book, throw it under your pillow, and sleep on it, <laughs> will you get in shape? No. 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 Worth a All right. <laughs> Gary said it's worth a try. Yeah. Well, I guarantee you at least get two sit ups a day one when you lay down, and one when you get up. But that's about it. God gave us a fitness book, right? Yes. The Bible. So this morning, what we're going to look at is you've already heard some of the story of Achan, or Achan, as someone else said. Uh, 
God had given some pretty specific directions. Okay? Somebody decided they didn't want to listen. Does anybody know why in the military and basic training they break your body down to that point and then start building it back up? That's how your muscles grow. You know what else they're doing when they're breaking down your body? They're breaking down your psyche. And they're going to make sure that when you're in battle and you're in that moment, that you've got to give one last push, one last hurrah, that you're going to do it. So before we start today, I'm going to tell you about this time I went whitewater rafting. I can't swim. I can doggy paddle better today than I could when I went whitewater rafting. Couldn't swim at all. It was a bachelor party way, 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 way up in Maine. It is actually, uh, and I forget the name of the place, but it's the hardest whitewater rapids they will allow a tour to go on in the entire US. It's a 5.5. Six is the hardest, but a tour can only go on a 5.5. They will tell you that the locals have insisted on it being a 5.5 for tourism, and it probably is closer to a six. So here we are. I'm thinking, great, I'm going to die. My current brother-in-law at the time was just dating my sister, and he knew some different things with my family, and he was convinced he was not going to tell my parents that they lost another child through water. And so he says, what are you going to do? Like, maybe you should pretend you're sick. I said, no way. I'm going. I am nuts. So we get there. And it's a small outfit, so I meet the owner and I said, uh, listen, I have a problem. I watched my foster brother drown in front of me when I was 10, and I'm a little afraid of the water, but I'm not on this bachelor party to not partake. He goes, don't worry. We've got a guy here that's never tipped, never had any issues. He's our number one guy for 10 years running. We'll put you in his boat. I thought, okay, good. We get to the side, everybody's getting in. I said, where's the guide? Where's the guy that's never tipped? They finally introduced me to him. He is the youngest guy. I thought, you're not old enough to have done this for 10 years. He looked like he was my age at the time I was 22. So I said, all right, well, here goes nothing. And uh, he says, this is what I want you to do. You're going to sit in the back of these rafts. They're about 18 feet. You know, you've got rows of people. You're supposed to lock your toes into the spot on the raft. And then there's a rope. He said, um, listen, just sit in front of me, I'll protect you. Because the bachelor party was the size it was and the boats were the size they were, there was going about eight boats. Our boat had the one and only female on the trip in our boat. <clears throat> we get out on the water and this knucklehead of a guide says, do you guys want to go for the fun trip or the boring trip? The girl immediately turns around and goes, fun trip. So I was not going to say boring trip. <laughs> I look at the guide and I'm like, are you kidding me? Maybe some other choice words, but under my breath. And uh, he goes, all right, so here's the deal. We're literally going to get about 50 yards down the river and there's a waterfall. This is how it works. When I say everybody give one last dig with your paddle, you give one last dig or we won't clear the waterfall. And then you grab onto the rope like this and you hunker down. I thought to myself, Josh, you better get the hardest dig you have possible. <laughs> so we went 50 yards, the entire boat, and I am not lying, the guy even told them this, all grabbed the rope and only I gave one last dig. And we went <laughs> <laughs> They all, because they grabbed the rope, were able to get out and on top while I was trapped underneath. You laugh. I thought I was dead. <laughs> We're in a waterfall. I'm trying to get out, don't know which way to go, and get myself directly into a waterfall and just get pushed further down and wedged between two rocks. I think I'm done. They make you watch this video. Relax. I thought, who are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> then they tell you, you've got a helmet on, but you're just supposed to, when you finally do get out, you're supposed to get your feet facing down. I don't know which way my feet are facing. Somehow, by God's mercy, I pop out. I literally start flying through the rapids, headfirst into rocks. I get spun around, I finally get stopped. 
the guy says to everybody, you know, you all hurt by not digging in one last time. By not following the instructions, you almost lost a member of the boat. But I've never tipped in 10 years. I'd like to go over it again. I said, oh no, I'm not going over it again. <laughs> this time I didn't care that the girl was saying yes. <laughs> the guy looked at me and he says, you can stay here and be afraid for the rest of the day, or you can walk with us. I'm gonna make them carry your stuff in the boat and you can have a good day. I said, that makes sense. This time when we went over, he told the entire group that I was going to hold the rope and they could all do one final dig. I said, nope, I'm doing one final dig in case that my little bit extra doesn't make the difference. When we sailed over the waterfall and we made it, we were fine. I ended up having a great day. But you have to follow the instructions. You have to do what you were told. You're not going to lose weight if you sleep on the fitness book. You're not going to take over the land God told you to take over if you don't follow instructions. So this morning we're looking at this guy named Achan. In, the, in this particular NIV calls them devoted things. Other places are going to say God's things. If you go back, and we're not going to go into all of this in depth, because we've got communion today, and I'm going to try and keep it so that everybody can get home in time for the Patriots <clears throat> pregame. Um, I'm kidding. We're not going to be here until one. Um, but God told them that when you go into the land, one of the first things they're supposed to do is give him of the first fruits. Okay? Jericho was the first city they took. We talked about that last week. Everything in Jericho was supposed to go to God or to the temple, to the Levites, to the priests. And they knew that. They were told how to march around. They were told how they had to be quiet. They were told what they had to do. There were specific instructions. And then when you go in, all the plunder for Jericho was to go to God. Now, anything after that, they would get for themselves. You got this one guy, and God only knows what he was thinking. But he looks down, and he sees a little gold, and a little silver, and a robe, and he thinks, I'm going to help my family get ahead. And he breaks the commandment. Now, the crazy part about this is if you go back and you look at chapter 6, I typed it out here, verses 18 and 19, where Joshua had said to the people, this is before they took Jericho, but keep away from the devoted things so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. They knew this. They understood this. This was something that had been happening, so, well, really since Abraham. Abraham gave to Melchizedek. And then when, they, when Moses brought them out, there was always this offering. These have to happen. There's this first fruits was to God. They knew this. Joshua gives them a warning. He says, listen, if you mess this up, you're not just bringing trouble on yourself. You're bringing trouble on all of Israel. Now let's talk about AI. Let's make it a little bit more modern. Okay? Jericho might have been like taking down Lynn. Anybody ever heard of Switzerland, New Hampshire? No? Okay, one person. Anybody know what the population is in Switzerland, New Hampshire? It's right on the sign when you drive into it and if you blink, you miss it. 20? You guys are close. It's like 92. Okay? So AI would have been like taking Switzerland, New Hampshire. Okay, Lynn would have been a struggle. Like Jericho, they had to follow the rules. AI, you know, the, the captain of the guard says to Joshua, listen, send two, 3,000 guys up there. Don't worry about it. It's nothing. We'll clear that right out. No big deal. They end up being chased back by this small little contingent of people. 36 people are dead. 
Joshua's freaking out. What is going on? I like what Laurie noticed when Joshua went and put his face to the ground. He said, I'm not moving God till you tell me what happened. I don't get this. We didn't do anything wrong. Then comes the answer. Get up off your face. There's sin in the camp. Somebody stole from me. Now remember, they get to take the plunder from every other city. Part of why I had first, uh, first two verses of chapter 8 read was because the first thing that God says to them, um, after he says, I've delivered them into your hand and everything else, he says, you should do to Ai as you did to the Jericho, except that you may carry off their plunder and livestock for yourselves. It's going to be this way moving forward. You didn't have to take anything from Jericho because from here on out, it's yours. One guy. I say trying to get ahead. I don't know what his thoughts were. The Bible doesn't tell us. But one guy, when they took over Jericho, you just watch these walls collapse. Whether you believe, as some do, that by the shouting they created an earthquake, which would be one way these walls would collapse. Whether you think that blowing of the trumpets so they could dig underneath and get the walls to collapse. Whatever your thought is on this, you just saw the walls of Jericho collapse. And you took your eyes off what God did and you said, ooh, I can get this in my belt, nobody will notice. Oh, here's a little silver I can take. Nobody loves it. This robe would look really good on my wife. Yeah, but she can't wear it. How's she going to go out in public? Well, that's from Jericho. Well, what was he thinking? Well, let's bring it down to us. <laughs> do you ever have things that you know are wrong and you do anyways? I do all the time. I told you guys before about my driving. I love to go fast. I know it's wrong. I know the Bible says obey the laws of the land. I still go speeding. You know how many times I've gotten behind slow people? I'm frustrated. I'm yelling at them. You can ask Alicia. She tells me I'm horrible. And then all of a sudden, I'll see a cop and I'll think, wow, God, you saved me again. <laughs> I did not deserve that. But there's been other times where he just let the cop come right out and get me, too. That's a simple example. But where's the justification? There is none. I have a brother that's extremely, extremely intelligent, and they were doing some research. And according to him, the difference in, in a... 90 minute ride of going 85 or 65 is six seconds. You will arrive six seconds sooner. I can't tell you the breakdown of all that, but he did and I was like, okay, all right, fine. Because you're saving six seconds. Like by the time you're unbuckled, I'm pulling up too, doing the speed limit. What's the difference? You can look at this guy, Aiken. Aiken, you're going to get the plunder from any place you want. Never mind the fact that you're from the tribe of Judah, and if we go back into Deuteronomy and Leviticus, I could break down for you all that means, and that depending on your tribe, you're going to get a bigger area, so there's a chance you're going to get more land just by the fact that you're in the biggest tribe. This guy had everything going for him already. What, what went through his head? What in him said, you know what? I don't know. I really don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. You think about what it was. But then stop and, and, and think about yourself. Think about the areas of your life where you do your thing. It's not difficult. We justify it in many different ways. We all have different opinions and thoughts. Like the time the drug addict told me, oh, I'm not addicted. I can stop any time. I just like the way it feels. You know what the worst part is? He really believed himself. 
You see, we've, we've come to this place where we just we work everything out in our own mind. Somehow Achan knew the truth. Listen, you didn't travel around in, in, in Israel. You didn't go around the way that this worked. They're supposed to bind the law on their hearts. They're supposed to always have it with them. You say, well, how do you know that? Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. These are the commands, decrees, and the laws of the Lord your God directed to me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. This is Moses talking to the people of Israel. So that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you so that you may enjoy long life. Hear, Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The Lord, the Lord your God with all your heart, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commitments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. There's no way Achan didn't know. You know, I've been giving homework every week and having you read things. Part of the reason is for that, you're not going to stand before God and have never read this. Because if you do, he's going to say, no, you knew. This is telling you everything you need to know. You've got it. You've got the answer. And I'll make you a deal. Anyone who doesn't have a Bible see me afterwards, I will get you one. All right? We're supposed to know what's right, what's wrong. I often find it more amazing that people that never set foot in church know more about the Bible than those of us who do go to church every Sunday. But the thing we have to look at is this. Where are we being aching? Where are we the ones holding up the blessings of God? Where are we the ones holding us up from growing as a church? See, you can't get fit if you're only sleeping on the fitness book. You can't live right if the Bible just sits on a shelf. In Matthew, this is Jesus speaking, chapter 22. This entire chapter is when the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they keep trying to catch Jesus in something. Keep trying to trip him up. There's something he hasn't thought of. We'll get him this way. We'll get him that way. So finally, after the Sadducees have had their shot, the Pharisees, they get together, right? It says in verse 34, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. This is that group, you know, like when you see someone else, you're like, all right, we can do this. We'll show everybody up. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus makes it a little bit more difficult on him. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. What's Jesus saying? Listen, stop trying to twist, to angle, to make it fit to you. The simple truth is this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, number one. Number two, love your neighbor as yourself. I don't care who you are, you love yourself. If you didn't, you'd be dead. You feed yourself? Did you put clothes on today? Did you look in the mirror before you came here? Probably. Damn. (laughs) 
And then you get here and play all pious. <laughs> Let's be real. You love yourself. Do you love other people the same way? That's the commandment. As we head towards communion, the challenge today, this consequences for our disobedience. Imagine being Aiken when this was found out. AI loses. It wasn't but just the week before anyone who takes anything that's devoted to God you bring harm on your family, and you bring harm on Israel. Alicia, when she was reading this this past week, she says to me, his whole family took the consequence of his mistake. Look it up. We didn't have time to read all of it, but they actually stoned the whole family, including his cattle and his donkeys, and then lighted on fire. There is no war, the family of Achan. See, sometimes we don't think about how our disobedience affects even later generations. Our choices matter. Our decisions will affect things for a long time to come. I'll close with one final story, which I think I've shared before, but maybe I haven't. I was 19 years old, had a five-hour layover in Frankfurt, Germany, on my way to build a church in Romania. You know, there's walk signs and do not walk signs for a reason. Either way, we've been in Frankfurt for a couple hours. I thought I had figured things out. I see these two German ladies sitting, waiting for the signal thinking that the entire world was pedestrian, has the right of way, although that's really a New England thing. Looked to the right and saw curb to curb traffic coming at me. Looked to the left, saw no traffic coming at me, and thought I'd step out and show them how to cross the street. I didn't even get a quarter of the way across, and I realized these people are not stopping. The police officer that was on the trip with us gauged their speed to be somewhere between 40 and 50 miles an hour. I promise you, the difference between me and the car was no further than that wall. I jumped, took out my legs, threw me through the air. I landed on the street to notice the truck was still not stopping. What had happened was this was traffic coming this way too. It wasn't a one way. It was too late. I claw my way to the side of the sidewalk. I am running on adrenaline. I can't believe I'm alive. The German police that we talked to told us we were lucky that the people didn't stop because they could have charged me to fix her car. I was the one in the wrong. See, what does that story have to do with anything? For the rest of my life, I live in back pain because my lower back looks like this. Because of an option to disobey what some would call a stupid walk sign. It'll affect the rest of my life. Today's sermon is a challenge to us. What are we doing? Where are the places in our lives that we're intentionally looking for ways to create angles and sinning? And do we realize how it's affecting our personal lives, our personal families, and just as importantly, how is it affecting our church because of our decisions? Questions only you can answer. Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity just to be in your house. Got a sobering message, really, when we stop and we think about it. A one man's sin it just ruined and hurt and bring down an entire nation. God, I ask that you would challenge each and every one of our hearts and our lives today to look inward, to look at ourselves. God, where are we hurting the body of Christ? Where are we hurting our own families? God, may you just give us these things to think about on this week. We ask all this in Jesus' name.
Amen. I'll be reading from Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 through 28, for the words of institution. And then I will, when we go to hand it out, we can hold the elements. We'll take them all together. And at that time, I'll read from 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 26. Matthew chapter 26. And while they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. 1 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to remember you and the work that you did on Calvary for us. In Jesus' name. In the same way after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he come. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity just to remember you in the shed blood, how it forgives our sins. In Jesus' name. This time, if you'll stand, turn your handle to 426, 426. opportunity to be in your house. Challenge us, God. Challenge our hearts and lives. Challenge the way that we look at things. Challenge what we do. God, challenge the way that we justify what we do. We thank you for this opportunity. Go with us this day. In Jesus' name, amen.